Okay, now we get into what I call the fun portion of the seminar. Just like Paul's writings, he gets real doctrinally, likes to talk about doctrine, and then he gets more into the practice. <clears throat> well, we've looked at four of the critical words uh, that is a good to wrap your head around and understand how to communicate. And uh, now I want to talk about various ways to share the gospel, various methods or uh, a means of making the gospel clear. If you have your gift cube, go ahead and get it out. Now, you have to take the plastic off of it. I was uh, in an airplane one time, and they passed out these little sandwiches, <clears throat> and I bit into it. I could not get a bite off of it, and the guy next to me said, hey, it would help if you took the cellophane wrapper off. And one of those saran wrap things, I, c I couldn't tell it was on there. <clears throat> so it works a lot better if you take that little plastic thing off. <clears throat> this is something <clears throat> I designed in my head when I became blind. <clears throat> I had some basic pictures of what I wanted to use since uh, sighted people are such a pain. You know, they always want to see things. <clears throat> So I figured, well, I'll accommodate the sighted people, those poor handicapped people that can't visualize things in their mind. <clears throat> and uh, it starts off real easy. You gotta find the picture of the, the, the gift all by itself. Not the gift in the hand, but the gift all by itself. <clears throat> now these have magnets in it, which kind of makes them nifty, keep people like to click them and all that stuff. But I start off, I try to start off with a positive note. And so find the, the, the gift and look at it yourself. Eventually you need to be able to show it to other people. I'm able to do this as a blind person if you get me on the right you know, picture the first time. So if I can do it, you can do it. It also has little arrows to show you how to open it the correct way. <clears throat> but with the, uh, the present, I say this, that, that God loves you. And because he loves you, he has a special gift for you. But before you can really appreciate his gift, you really have to understand some bad news. So let me share some bad news with you, and then we'll get to the good news. And then you open it up to the, um, uh, the arrow, the arrows missing the target, and the ladder going to heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Allergies are kicking in. And when I get to the target with the arrows, it's uh, Romans 3.23, we've all sinned, we've missed the mark. Nobody is perfect. Uh, and uh, the Bible makes it very clear. Um, Psalm 14 says, there are none who are good, not even one. It's important to get them to agree with that because you don't want them to come back later and say, well, I haven't really done anything wrong. You want them to know that you, you know, you've admitted that you're a sinner. <clears throat> Then secondly, the picture with the ladder into heaven, some religions teach that you have to take steps to get into heaven. You know, maybe go to church, be kind, give to the poor, any number of works and good deeds. Um, but the Bible teaches clearly that even if you've sinned once, you're not allowed into heaven. The wages or the payment for sin <clears throat> is death, Romans 6, 23. Now that's the bad news. I'm not here to teach or preach religion. It's something entirely different. So open it up to the next frame. It goes square, horizontal, horizontal, square, horizontal, horizontal, square, if that helps you at all. So the, uh, <clears throat> the next horizontal is you see the cross and the empty tomb. Uh, and you explain to them, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, or some other verse dealing with the death that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you to pay for your sins. He died on your behalf. And then the other picture with the empty tomb <coughs> represents how he rose from the dead. Now, this should look familiar to you. What does that represent, those two pictures? The gospel, the two essential elements of the gospel. They're like the jewel in the crown, the jewel in the plan of salvation, as you explain it to them, is the gospel, the fact that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. <clears throat> then you fold it back, and the next picture should be a chair, right? You got it? 
okay. And if there's a chair available, I use this illustration. I say, now, suppose, uh, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? So you have to do something with that message. Is Jesus asking, I mean, is the Bible asking you simply to accept that it's true or agree with it? Or is it asking something more? For example, if I tell this stool or tell you, I accept that this stool will hold me up, I believe that it will, am I trusting in that stool right now? No, I'm still standing here. If I tell the stool, I'll make you Lord of my life, I'll give my life to you, um, I'll, I promise to serve you and be a better person, am I trusting in the stool right now? No, it's not till I actually sit down <clears throat> that I gain the benefit of resting in the chair, trusting in the chair to hold me up and give me rest. And that's what God is asking a person to do, is to trust in Christ that he died in their place, rose from the dead, and offers them the free gift of eternal life by simple faith in him. <clears throat> okay, now you go to the, uh, the next horizontal, and that should be a workman with a shovel, which represents work, a workman with a shovel plus a gift, which is works plus a gift, and uh, a gift alone. Does that look familiar? That's like the W, W plus G, and G, but I did it in pictorial form for you visually oriented people. Um, and I go basically through the, the three circles like I did with Nora. I say, now which of these three graphics represents how a person gets to heaven? Is it by his works, works plus um, gift, or a gift? And which picture do they most often pick? The middle one. They want to cover their bases. I start out positively, and I say, well, you know, you guessed right that it wasn't the first one. Romans 4, 5, uh, but to him who does not work, but uh, trust in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. So it's not by works. That would be a false gift. Wouldn't be a gift at all. <clears throat> It'd be no gift. <clears throat> and then the second picture, our graphic, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> second graphic <clears throat> would be the works plus grace, and that's Romans 11:6. You quote that one. If it's by grace, then it's not by works, otherwise grace is no more grace. That would be a, a false gift. So the only uh, proper answer is uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you save through faith. Now. The strength of that is that you can go through a whole presentation and if you don't test them, they may just be telling you what they think you want them to say. <clears throat> this makes them think. And uh, many times it will reveal their heart that they really haven't trusted in Christ. They're still hanging on to their own good works and some capacity to save them from eternal condemnation or to give them eternal life. At this point, if I feel pretty certain they've trusted the Lord, I'll stop. Uh, this isn't in your cube, or gift cube, but I'll say, now, if you have, if you would like to know you have eternal life, let me just lead you in a conversation with God. And I do it with their eyes open. I don't ask them to pray, because prayer doesn't save you. I do it with their eyes open. Or if it's in a group of people, <clears throat> I might ask them just to close their eyes so they can concentrate more clearly on what I'm saying without distractions. And I'll say something very simple. I'll say, well, just admit to God that you've done things wrong, which is kind of the first part of the plan of salvation. And I pause. I'll let them say something like that in the quietness of God, in the quietness of their own heart to God. <clears throat> Sometimes they say it out loud, which is fine. And then I'll say, and then just admit to God that you understand there's a penalty. That penalty is to be eternally separated from God because you've done things wrong. And then pause. And then thirdly, I'll say, and tell God that you understand that Jesus Christ paid the price in your place. That he died, that he rose from the dead. And I'll pause. And then fourthly, I'll say, now tell God this, that you're trusting only in Jesus Christ, not in your own goodness or religion or whatever they may have brought up before in a previous conversation. So you're trusting only in Jesus Christ. And then I'll close with something like this. I'll say, now, 
if this is the first time you've understood the message, and sometimes I'll ask them, is this the first time you've heard this? And they go, yeah. And I say, well, if this is the first time, and right now today, you're trusting only in Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and rose from the dead, uh, you have eternal life. If it's a group of people, I'll say, just let me ask you with all eyes closed, just put your hand up and put it down real quick. And then I said, it's just for me to know that I've been clear. And I usually have somebody up here to tell me whether or not we had any hands, anybody that trusted the Lord. Again, <clears throat> uh, my uh, field director in Liberia trained 25 people to do that. And one weekend, they came back on a Monday and reported 780 people had trusted in Christ, had never heard the message of grace. Uh, it would be difficult to conceive that that would happen here in Maryland because the ground in the United States is becoming increasingly hard. Uh, overseas, <clears throat> there are ponds and pockets of areas <clears throat> where the fish are really biting. <clears throat> in America, they have so much, who needs God? You know, I'm afraid the poorest person in America is 10 times richer <clears throat> than the average person in the countries where I visit. And so these people know what it is to hurt, even to go hungry, not have enough clothes, whatever. Um, so don't be discouraged if you don't see a lot of results. America is a tough country to evangelize. It's not as bad as Western Europe. It's getting that way. Uh, but it's, it's still becoming increasingly more difficult. Now, you got three more pictures. <clears throat> if I feel pretty certain they trusted the Lord, then I go to the first one, which is the padlock. I want them to know they can feel secure. They're locked in to eternal life. And I'll quote a verse like John 10, 28 and 29, where Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of my hand, and no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. You're double secure. Once you put your faith in Christ, it's a gift. He will not take it back. It's, otherwise, it wouldn't be a gift. It'd be a bribe or it'd be a false gift. It's an absolute free gift. And so you can know you have eternal life. Um, and then the, the next picture with the man giving thanks to God with his hands raised is I explain why we do good works. And sometimes if they haven't trusted the Lord, just like in Nora's case in that earlier session, a little light will go off in their head and they'll go, oh, I see now. Good works is what we do to tell God thank you and to show our gratefulness, okay? And then the, the third picture, <clears throat> you kind of have to hunt for this one. It's the gift in a hand. You see somebody passing on the gift to someone else? <coughs> I encourage them <clears throat> in the next few days to share this gift cube or to share the gospel with somebody. <clears throat> they tend to make <clears throat> really good evangelists because usually if they just trusted in Christ, all their friends were unbelievers. So they got all kinds of contacts. Secondly, they're enthusiastic because if they truly underst understood it, they know how exciting it is to know that that weight has been taken off their shoulders, how their sins have been forgiven. <clears throat> and thirdly, if you've been clear in sharing the gospel, guess what? They'll be clear. Not until they come to church and they hear all these other ways of unclear terminology do they sometimes become uh, less clear than they should be when it comes to sharing the gospel. Um, <clears throat> Uh, some of the diagnostic qu questions that I use intermittently is things like, if you died right now, and I might use this at the end, uh, would you go to heaven? I just want to make sure they have some assurance of salvation. Uh, another question, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven right now? Some of these kind of diagnostic questions can be helpful and really zeroing in and making sure they understood the gospel. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Let me speed down through here. Okay. Some of the major points to include in um, your presentation, if you can. 
I think it's, I'm not sure what page this is on. Uh, the fact that God loves you, and wants you to be in heaven with him. Uh, well, there's a bunch of them. I'll let you read that. You guys can read. <clears throat> okay, workbook 24. <clears throat> How to make the gospel presentation really, really clear. Okay? One, remember, the issue in salvation is trusting in Christ alone to be saved. Don't make anything else the issue. The main thing is to make the main thing the main thing. So stay focused. It's not faith in faith or faith in religion or faith in our ability to be committed. It's faith in Christ and what he did on the cross. Uh, the safest thing, as I said, is to use the wording of the New Testament. And that wording is to trust in Christ or to believe can be used, but quite often believe means simply to accept something as true. So I use predominantly trust or depend on or rely on. Now I mentioned earlier there was one book that did not use the word repentance. Do you remember what book that was? Okay. How many times does it use the word pistuo to believe or trust? About 98, 99 times, depending on the translation. If that's the emphasis, that of uh, the gospel, evangelism, then I think we should probably learn from John and use the most simple, clearest terminology. Um, <clears throat> number two, since the issue is trusting in Christ, then learn to ask the people to trust in Christ. I was in um, Latvia another time teaching a seminar, and I kind of went through the, uh, the gift cube a little bit to the three different things, and uh, I said, now, if they say that they understand that they need to trust in Christ alone to be saved, what do we do next? And she says, oh, you go back to the chair illustration. <laughs> I said, no, you ask them to trust in Christ. You see, uh, sometimes we want to just dance all around the subject, but we don't want to really ask them to trust in Christ. I think you need to do that. <clears throat> it's a little risky. They may say no. Or they may say, well, I don't really understand. Then you can walk them through that conversation with God and cover the basic points of the plan of salvation. But learn to ask people, uh, to ask people to trust in Christ. A, a preacher one time went to Spurgeon and he said, you know, uh, I'm finding that people don't seem to be coming to faith in Christ every time I preach. <clears throat> and Spurgeon said, <clears throat> Well, you don't expect somebody to come to faith in Christ every time you preach, do you? And the young preacher said, oh, no, no, of course not. And Spurgeon said, well, that's the problem. You need to expect that people, somebody's going to be there. I hope and expect that maybe somebody here who's attending the seminar <clears throat> might have trusted Christ. If you haven't, then let me encourage you to do that. It's the greatest gift you can ever receive. He wants to take away all your sins. He's already paid for them. And then in turn, in return for you trusting in him, he gives you the free gift of eternal life and a promise in heaven someday. What could be greater than that? And it's not unusual for somebody who has attended a seminar like this to trust in Christ. <clears throat> we had, <clears throat> I taught one in uh, Nigeria, uh, excuse me, in Nicaragua, and um, there was like 20 pastors there. No, actually it was 37 pastors and 20 city officials, and I gave an invitation towards the end just to kind of model it for the pastor so they could see how I'd do it. And uh, my field director at the end, he gasped, and I said, what's the matter? He said, three of the pastors in the front row just raised their hand, they trusted in Christ, as well as in a number of the city officials. So he was uh, surprised, you just never know. <clears throat> the devil is so deceitful, so clever, it's his job it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that it's the God of this age who has blinded the unbeliever to the glorious light of the gospel. And uh, so if we can help people see and understand and trust in Christ, that's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, word of caution for the next few points. Uh, don't be the policeman in the church. 
if somebody uses the phrases that I'm su gonna suggest that you not use, don't go around and correct them. <clears throat> You'll just make a bunch of enemies and you just create all kinds of problems for Pastor Kevin, he doesn't need that. <laughs> just be an example of clarity. <clears throat> that will go much farther than correcting people. Number three, I don't suggest to the unbeliever that they give something to God. Uh, examples like give your heart to Jesus. <clears throat> Very poetical. It may mean what you think it means in your ears, but it may mean something entirely different in the ear of the unbeliever. <clears throat> give your life to Christ. Well, I thought Jesus gave his life for us. Yeah, now we in turn can give our life back to Christ in service as a disciple, but that's not the same thing as trusting in Christ. Uh, surrender your life is another one that many people use. <clears throat> and if they mean surrender by trusting in Christ, well, that's fine. But that's not what the unbeliever hears. The, the unbeliever hears, oh, you mean I've got to give this up and give this up and start doing this and keeping the, you know. They don't understand it that way. Uh, commit your life to God, the same kind of thing. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Uh, put Jesus on the throne of your life. All of these phrases are great for discipleship, but when it comes to uh, communicating the free gift of eternal life, there, it's just too easy to misunderstand that. And remember what Spurgeon said, it's not good enough to be so clear that people understand you, but rather you must be so clear that people cannot misunderstand you. Uh, follow Jesus is another one. <clears throat> well, follow in, by believing, yeah, but follow by serving him. It's not our service that saves us. It's his death and resurrection on the cross. Um, a, it's a problem. Uh, for example, if, <clears throat> if you said you were going to give your life to find a cure for cancer, well, you mean I'm gonna work day and night until I find a cure for cancer. It communicates works. The same thing for commit your life to God. In fact, if you think it doesn't mean work, then you commit your life to me and I will work you like a dog, okay? You can come to my house and cut down some trees and mow the yard. It can convey some kind of works. <clears throat> uh, B, uh, the Bible does not use this for eternal salvation. And again, people go to verses that perhaps use the word sozo, to be saved, and they don't understand that the word to be saved can mean different aspects. It can mean to be saved from the penalty of sin. It can mean to be saved from the power of sin, in that case, of the life of a believer. It can mean to be saved from the very presence of sin. When we die or the Lord returns for, uh, from, uh, for us, we'll be eternally saved from the very presence of sin. So salvation <clears throat> in the Bible and the word sozo has a much broader meaning. So context is critical. You have to see who it's written to, what's the context, uh, what's the flow of the discourse, and most people are lazy. They don't wanna take the time to do that. It's just too easy to take a verse out of context. <clears throat> see, it's not you giving God anything, it's God who gives you everything. Second Peter 1 verse three talks about he's given us everything pertaining to life. <clears throat> so it's God who gave his life for us, not us who gives our lives to him for eternal salvation. Um, <clears throat> 1 John 5.11 talks about, uh, you might jot that down and read it sometime. Summary, I don't suggest to people that they give anything to God to be saved. Otherwise, uh, they'll move right into a works-oriented gospel. <clears throat> now, workbook 25, four, I don't suggest that the unbeliever invite Jesus into his heart or into his life. Very precious poetical words to some people, and I get pushback on that because sometimes people say, well, that's how I, I became a Christian. Well, good, but there, I've known people who said they've invited Jesus into the heart and they have no idea what the plan of salvation is or the gospel. They just kind of responded. And responding to something you don't understand is not the same as responding 
to a clear invitation to trust in Christ alone, who died for your sins and rose from the dead. So that's not the issue. The issue is to trust in Christ. Um, some refer to Revelations 3.20. A lot of evangelistic material does, and it has nothing to do with the plan of salvation. <clears throat> Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It's not talking about eternal salvation, it's talking about fellowship. A, the context is written to the church of Laodicea, to believers who've gone astray. B, it never says in your heart or in your life. It's not even in there, but they quote it as if it is. Uh, C, the preposition pros means to draw close to someone, not to come into someone. So it's not talking about coming into your heart or into your life. <clears throat> D, the Holy Spirit automatically comes into the believer once, uh, or the person once he believes, Ephesians 1.13. Um, letter E, we read elsewhere that Jesus is already inside the believer once a person believes. Colossians 1.27, uh, to whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. When a person trusts in Christ, that's one of 33 things that occur in the life uh, of a person who becomes a believer. I've got a list of those. If you wanted a list, uh, send me an email, dean at gocrossway.org, and I'll mail it on to you. But they're all inward manifestations that should be manifested outwardly, but many times they're not to the degree, of course, that we would like. <clears throat> John, okay, John 14 also has some verses on that. Uh, summary, so I don't use the phrase to invite Jesus into your heart or life to be saved. In my opinion, it's just too vague. Okay, workbook page 26, is, am I on the right page? Okay, uh, five, I don't suggest that people trust in prayer. Okay, now we've kind of touched on that already. Examples are like, would you like to pray to receive Christ? Well, again, it's not through prayer. Um, and even the word receive is a problem, but I'll deal with that later. Uh, and remember the chair illustration? you know, defining what faith is, that's far more effective than asking somebody to pray. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament do you find somebody saying, would you like to pray to receive Christ? They just, you know, confront them, look at them, tell them. And it wasn't until the 1800s that evangelists started using some kind of prayer as a means of getting people to, to that point of trusting in Christ. It doesn't make it wrong, uh, in my opinion, it's just not as crisp and clear and uh, doesn't follow more closely what I think the biblical norm should be. And yeah, I've covered that. Okay, so I don't use the phrase, would you like to pray to receive Christ? Six, I don't suggest to people that they promise something to God. Again, that's a gift with a hook or a, a string attached. That's not a real gift. Um, examples are, you need to clean up your life. You need to turn 180 degrees to be saved. Uh, and a lot of people use these phrases. And I, I think I know what they mean. They mean you need to stop trusting in whatever you're trusting in and trust in Christ alone. But that's not what the unbeliever hears. If you listen with the ear of an unbeliever and ask yourself, do I understand that this is a free gift? it will clear up a lot of the confusion that some people have. I think you have a, a booklet, <clears throat> should have been given out, called What's Up With That? Cutting Through the Confusion. It lists quite a few of those phrases. Uh, here's another one, turn from sin, we went over that. Turn or burn, try or fry, forsake or bake. I mean, you got all these cute little clever phrases as if we could ever turn enough from our sins to save ourselves. Now, certainly I'm not suggesting or encouraging people to go deeper in sin or to sin at all, uh, but it's not us turning from sin, it's turning to Christ and trusting in him that gives us eternal life and then gives us the potential 
you know, to live for him. But you can't live for him if you haven't trusted in him. There's a, there's a difference between entering the Christian life and living the Christian life. If you have to live the Christian life to go to heaven, to what degree? Nobody can answer that. If you can't answer that, then how can you know you have eternal life? You can't. And there's plenty, plenty of examples where people didn't live a very godly life, like Lot or even Abraham in some places. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, a man that was sleeping with his step. I mean, it's on and on, the examples of people that really didn't live a good Christian life. Uh, even Peter denied he knew Christ at the time, the day before Jesus was crucified. And he acted hypocritically and had to be rebuked by Paul in Galatia. So there's uh, plenty of examples where people have not really lived what we would call a good Christian life. So it, there's a distinction between the two. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, Romans 12, 1 is a good verse to keep in mind where it says, in view of these things, therefore, in view of what things? The, the fact that we're saved by grace, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices. He doesn't say you must present your bodies. Paul says, I urge you. It, you know, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable act of worship. It, it's reasonable that you show your gratitude and serve God. But it's not a requirement because if it is, I don't know anybody that's saved because nobody does it completely. Or to what degree do they have to do it? Nobody can answer that. So only Christ can live the Christian life. Uh, entering by faith gives you the ability or the power to live more for Christ but none of us are certainly perfect. So I don't use the wording to suggest that you promise something to God to be saved. Seven, I don't suggest that people accept or receive <clears throat> Jesus Christ. It is used in John 1, 12, where it says, uh, to those, uh, who, uh, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God even to those who what? Believed in him, pistuo, okay? Uh, so the one place where it is used in the evangelistic setting, and there's another one in John chapter five, both places in close proximity or the same verse, it uses the word believe. It defines what it means to receive Christ. Keep in mind, especially if you go to some of these uh, uh, Catholic countries, they receive Christ every Sunday when they take mass. They feel like they're receiving the elements. So uh, it's, it's a word that can be misunderstood. It's not quite as crisp and clear as what I prefer. I've been doing this a long time and I've seen some really good results. So I encourage you uh, again, not to use that phrase, to stick with the phrase that is used most often. Um, <clears throat> I uh, <clears throat> talked to this one guy in Belgium and he came to me and said he wanted to be baptized. And it was my last year in Belgium. And I said, well, why are you asking me? The elders have taken over that responsibility. And he said, well, they said that I should come talk to you. And I said, well, that's kind of strange. Uh, tell me uh, how you came to Christ. He says, well, I've accepted the Lord. I said, well, what does that mean? He says, well, I bought a Bible. I said, okay. What is that, is that all that it means to you? Well, I come to church on Sunday and I'm trying to live a good life. And I, so I sat down and I went over the three circles with him. And finally he understood, oh, it's not by what I do, it's by what Christ did. I said, bingo, you got it, okay. So it can be a word that is easily misunderstood, especially to those who are addicted to works for salvation, primarily all the unbelievers. Okay, page 27. 